It is my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Adam Buchwald as today's speaker for the Visiting Scholar Lecture. Uh, Dr. Buchwald is an Associate Professor in the Department of Communicative Sciences and Disorders at NYU. His work focuses on the production and perception of spoken and written language with a primary focus on individuals with acquired speech and language impairments subsequent to stroke. And his research combines different approaches from cognitive science, psycholinguistics, speech acoustics, and uh, cognitive neuropsychology. Adam also has uh, connections to many of us here at MRRI. Uh, our director, Dr. Dylan Edwards, was a former mentor uh, on Adam's K Award. Uh, Dr. Sharon Antonucci is a former colleague at NYU and a dog in law, if I have the family tree right. Um, I met Adam as a first year doctoral student at a motor speech conference in, in Groningen, the Netherlands. And I remember it vividly because, uh, in my opinion, Adam was presenting the cleverest experiment uh, that was on show uh, at that conference where he was taking advantage of an aspect of Eng English phonology to predict different uh, acoustic patterns um, for speech errors made by people with a phonological locus of impairment compared to those with a speech motor planning impairment. And I've read quite a few studies since, but this one remains my, one of my all time favorites. Uh, today, Adam is going to speak to us about optimizing stroke, stroke recovery in acquired speech impairment with non-invasive brain stimulation. And uh, I wanted to say thank you for accepting our invitation to talk today, and uh, the floor is yours. Um, thank you so much, uh, Maria Lisa. I'm, I'm really excited to be here, um, but also just to, to get a chance to see many of you who I um, haven't seen in a while, um, and to share a little bit about some of the research that we have ongoing in the lab. Um, ongoing has taken on a different meaning, I think, for many of us over the last couple of years, um, as um, you know, recruitment has slowed down drastically and so forth. But I, you know, I was trying to think about what would be the, the most interesting thing that I could talk to um, you know, the broader audience at Moss about not just these, you know, speech folks. And so that this is what I've sort of come up with. And I'm, I'm really interested to hear some feedback. I, I think part of what I've tried to do is sort of talk about things in a way that it's about sort of recovery more generally, um, and not exclusively about um, the speech and language domains. Um, okay, so um, stroke. As, as you know, as, as I know, is a, a major um, public health problem. Um, the US has over 7 million stroke survivors. Um, the latest estimates have about two and a half million of them um, having some kind of speech and language impairment following stroke. Um, there is some recovery. Recovery is possible, but it remains limited. And I think that there's many of us on the call that um, that sort of address this in one way or another in our research. Um, and kind of think that one way that to summarize sort of the, the overall findings is that individuals tend to improve at what they are doing while they are doing it. Um, but in across domains, um, motor language um, domains, there's limited maintenance and limited generalization. So once you take away the treatment, um, the effects can, can go, the, the positive treatment effects can go away, and also they're, they don't always generalize to new tasks. Um, so our big goal, sort of the, the idea that we're pursuing here is whether we can maximize treatment effects by changing how the brain is sort of absorbing treatment. Um, so changing how the brain is responding during treatment and whether that um, can, change the, these outcomes, particularly with respect to maintenance um, and, and maybe down the road generalization. Um, and so here we're gonna be focusing on whether we can promote recovery um, with non-invasive brain stimulation. So using non-invasive brain stimulation to change how the brain is responding during treatment sessions. Um, so uh, it, it's, it's known that after stroke, brains may settle into what we can think of as a non-optimal activation patterns to perform tasks. So, um, so while there may have been, while there 
tissue may exist for different patterns to be used. Um, we see that that for some individuals, um, you know, there the pattern that that you see following stroke may be suboptimal, such that um, uh, skills are being performed in a more lateralized way or a less lateralized way, or there's less interhemispheric um, connectivity um, following stroke. And so one idea is this, this idea of the network phenotype of stroke recovery um, from Siegel et al, um, where especially in the, the sort of language domain, it was seen that um, better recovery seemed to be um, associated with um, more left hemisphere activation, or maybe they, they had sort of said it the opposite way. So um, worse recovery seemed to be associated with um, less left hemisphere activation and less um, inter-hemispheric activation. Um, so sort of from that finding and from some other findings that um, I'll just briefly mention in a moment, um, there's this idea that maybe optimizing stroke recovery could include promoting very specific neural activation patterns. So if we, we look across, um, across treatment studies and we see that certain activation patterns are associated with better treatment outcomes, um, then we can try to steer the brain towards those activation patterns. Um, and so what we, what we consider here is both sort of at the level of the function that, that um, people are performing and at the level of the neural substrate. And hopefully that, that idea that I'm trying to say will become clearer over the next couple of slides. Um, so in the speech and language domain, so most of this work um, has actually really been done in language. Um, there isn't a whole lot that has separated speech and language, but um, a paper out of Roy Hamilton's lab uh, with Peter Trickletab um, from about a decade ago showed that um, in general, greater le left hemisphere activation in speech and language was associated with the best recovery and with the sort of caveat of when possible, which is sort of when there is some left hemisphere tissue there that could perform the roles that we need to perform. Um, so, you know, we sort of started in the lab thinking about, um, okay, so we want to promote left hemisphere activation very generally. So the problem is there's a, there's a really big problem space there. Um, the left hemisphere is large. Um, it's a whole hemisphere of the brain. Um, and it, it does a lot of, there's a lot of different things. And so if we have somebody with a, you know, reasonably sized left hemisphere stroke, they're likely to have deficits in a variety of different domains um, uh, within sort of speech and language. So this is just uh, an, uh, one of the individuals that we studied here. And this participant has difficulty with both sort of classic language um, impairment, such as retrieving words or forming sentences, as well as a more um, motor impairment, like spe uh, speech motor planning, um, which is um, tends to be referred to as a proxy of speech. Um, so somebody has a left hem hemisphere stroke, they have damage to all these different um, aspects of speech and language. And we wanna figure out, can we promote left hemisphere activation in order to lead to better outcomes? For me, that's a really big problem space and I need to sort of think about it in a much smaller way. And so this is why sort of the way that we're focusing on this is with respect to apraxia of speech. Um, so apraxia of speech is a speech motor planning or programming deficit um, that um, we see subsequent to stroke. Um, there's, uh, there's been a lot of ink spilled on the right way to diagnose apraxia of speech over the years. Um, in general, it's um, people describe it as dysprosodic or slowed speech, um, where you have speech sound distortions um, and sort of distorted sounds. What's important for us for, for this these purposes, I, as I said, I'm trying not to make this a, a talk about speech and language per se, is that the recovery tends to be promoted or, or there's some, some evidence that recovery is promoted by treatments that are based in motor learning principles. Um, and this becomes sort of um, the center here because we can build off our knowledge of the neural mechanisms of motor learning to try to enhance recovery um, in this aspect of impairment. So maybe what didn't come across as clearly as it could have is it's very common that individuals with left hemisphere strokes affecting speech and language have a variety, a constellation of, um, of areas of impairment. And so we're trying to sort of 
we're trying to ask this question, can we steer how the brain is responding during treatment to change outcomes? For me, I need to look at something very um, small and clean. And so this is why we're sort of looking at um, this motor learning um, aspect. So in general, motor learning um, treatment involves practicing a motor skill. Um, and this is something that I think probably across the labs at Moss, you have individuals who work on this. Um, the underlying mechanism is typically thought of as practice dependent plasticity, which leads to associative or heavy in learning. So this is um, everybody's favorite mantra, um, neurons that fire together, wire together. Um, so the idea is that the neural regions that are active during practice, um, you have somebody practicing something, the neural regions that are active during practice start um, becoming a stronger network. Um, and so this is really relevant for these individuals that have acquired apraxia of speech. Um, if we want to get the left hemisphere to be playing a stronger role again during treatment, uh, sorry, in, in language production, then during treatment, we want to stimulate those areas and make those areas more likely to be active while somebody is practicing a task. So um, somebody has difficulty producing um, speech while they're practicing speech, we want to make sure that we're engaging that part of the system. Um, and it is possible that that part is already being engaged, but that th the goal here is to try to create that sort of extra plastic state in um, during the um, speech motor learning treatments. Um, so we're trying to promote the activation of very specific regions during practice um, to strengthen that network and ultimately potentially lead to recovery. Um, and so we're gonna do this using non-invasive brain stimulation. I recognize about half of you probably know this topic as well or better than I do. Um, I'm still gonna give a little bit of an overview of um, of the part of non-invasive brain stimulation that we're using. Um, so we're using transcranial direct current stimulation or TDCS. Um, TDCS has a constant low intensity current that flows through electrodes that are placed on the scalp. Um, part of why it's been exciting in the stroke rehab literature is that, that it's so well tolerated with um, and safe with really minimal risk. And um, so, um, this picture here just reflects a one by one montage, meaning that um, the, the anode and the cathode are going to a single electrode each. Um, this is not the montage that we're using during our uh, treatment study, but I just wanted to sort of show this. And so um, the cortical tissue near the anode, there's a slight depolarizing effect. The cortical tissue near the cathode or, or that's being stimulated by the cathode has a slight hyperpolarizing effect. So all this means is that you're basically changing the resting potential a tiny bit of those, of those cortical regions. Um, and um, the regions that we want to stimulate are going to be, um, sorry, the, the place that we put the electrodes is going to be determined by the regions we want to stimulate. So all you're doing is changing the um, is, is changing the resting potential essentially of, of the cortical tissue um, that's receiving stimulation from the current and and that alone doesn't necessarily do anything. It'll last for a while and then it'll go away. And so what's really needed is to also have some sort of pathway specific activation. Um, that's what's going to be required to affect synaptic plasticity in some way, and sort of to really change how the brain is responding. And so um, the idea here, um, which is hopefully becoming clearer, is that we're trying to stimulate very specific regions um, of, um, of the, the cortex during treatment in order to make those regions more likely to be active during that treatment and therefore to strengthen their role in performing the task that's being performed. And in this case, is a speech production task. Um, so the main approach here is to use TDCS as an adjunct to treatment. Um, so we begin with something, and I, I think anybody who works with TDCS sort of knows this, you wanna begin with something that works, and then you wanna enhance um, the thing that works. And so um, we begin with a, a training or treatment that enhances performance, and then we pair that behavioral treatment with um, TDCS, TDCS um, targeting some specific region of interest. Um, and sort of the treatment or training is providing that pathway specific activation. So by having somebody in this case, having somebody practice 
um, speech production um, on a regular basis is going to engage um, the circuitry involved in speech production. Um, and by having additional current, so changing, making the, the tissue in, in these particular left hemisphere regions more likely to be, um, by, by changing their resting potential or making them more likely to be active during that um, treatment task. Um, and then we're going to compare essentially stimulation conditions. Um, this is what, what people do in general. This is what we're doing, um, comparing sort of active versus sham stimulation. Um, so um, so th this is a general approach. We're not um, special for doing this. Several of you have done this. Um, so I, I think what we're excited about here and, and what we think is potentially where we're gonna learn something new um, is with our outcome measures, is looking at both the behavioral change, the speech production accuracy, as well as the neurobiological change. So the goal here is to stimulate, um, we'll, we'll get into the specifics in a minute, but to stimulate these sort of ventral parts of the um, precentral gyrus during um, speech production, and we want them to become more engaged during speech production, and we want to strengthen their role in the network involved in speech production. We want to enhance the, their connectivity. And so um, we're going to look at both, you know, are we enhancing people's ability to produce speech, the sort of gold standard in any treatment research? Are people getting better? Um, and then we're going to try to look at the neurobiological change to get at and probably not as much as we want to, but to get at a little bit of like, how are people getting better? Like, how is this treatment working? Um, it's sort of the goal here. Um, so um, the treatment overview, again, I, I don't want to belabor the um, speech production, the, the, the sort of speech and language um, side of it too much, but I want to give you, a, give everybody a sort of a sense of what it is that we're doing. So. Um, we are doing a multiple baseline, multiple probe crossover single subject design. So these are um, basically we're, we're seeing people for about four months. Um, and um, in that time, we first get really good scans um, from them. Um, and, and I'll talk about that in a moment. Um, and then we um, get some baseline sessions. So in these single subject designs, you want to vary the number of baseline sessions you give from individual to individual so that it's not just some, uh, maybe on the fourth session, people get better, that, that you know that it's sort of tied to the treatment you're giving. Um, so we give um, some number of baseline sessions, and then we have a treatment phase um, for 12 sessions. We have people coming in three times a week for 12 sessions. Um, and then, um, and during that time, they're either receiving sham or nodal stimulation, and they're, re they're receiving treatment on a specific um, type of speech sequence. Um, and then we have a, the crossover design, so we, they then have a second phase in which they're receiving speech treatment with either sham or nodal stimulation, the, the opposite one. And so, um, so obviously what we care about are, you know, are, we're, we're treating we, we have these treatment sessions with um, either sham or, sorry, I shouldn't just be saying a nodal, sham or active stimulation. Um, we care about are people getting better? Um, hopefully people are going to improve. We're gonna see good treatment outcomes for both conditions, right? Cause we're starting with something that we think works. Um, so we're gonna see good treatment outcomes for both conditions. Hopefully we see, or, or the hypothesis here is that we would see better and especially longer lasting treatment outcomes. Um, for the condition with active stimulation compared to the condition with the sham stimulation. Um, and then we're also going to be looking at changes in neural activity um, after the, the phase that has active stimulation and the phase that has sham stimulation. And that, that will be counterbalanced across individuals. Um, so for the, for the species, um, the way that we're actually doing this, um, we're, we're either looking at clusters or single sounds and we treat um, stop initials, stop or fricative, sorry, stop initial sounds in one condition and fricative initial sounds in the other condition. The idea here, there's actually a fair amount of work suggesting that if you treat one, it doesn't carry over to the other. And so this actually allows us to do one of these crossover designs where people aren't necessarily improving at the other task. Of course, we're also probing that throughout to make sure that people aren't improving. Um, 
it's a it's it's one of those bummers in terms of generalization. If you treat one one manner of articulation, you don't get improvement in the other manner of articulation. That's that's not great. But as far as allowing us to ask the scientific question, I think it um it it's a little bit helpful here. Um, so this is sort of the the behavioral overview. Um, so we have similarities and differences across participants. Um, so um, everybody is getting um, targets in, that differ in manner, although um, some people are getting singleton sounds and some people are getting clusters depending upon their severity. Um, everybody receives one arm of sham stimulation and one arm of active stimulation, though that's counterbalanced. Um, we have a, a range of multiple uh, baseline sessions so that so that we can really see that if there's an improvement, it's related to the onset of the treatment as opposed to just um, seeing a clinician a few times. Um, and for everybody that we're um, gonna work with, we're targeting, and I'll get into why in a moment, but we're targeting ventral, premotor, and motor cortices in our treatment, um, but the electrode location is gonna depend entirely on their lesion. Um, so right now, uh, again, this is one of those things I it seemed worth it to present work in progress um, even just because of even though progression is so slow right now during COVID and um, so I only have complete data from three individuals that, that I'm going to be presenting and so these are their um, this just gives you a sense of the the lesions um, and you can see very different lesion sizes across these individuals see one individual doesn't even doesn't have a lot of residual tissue in the left hemisphere. Um, um, and uh, whereas it ranges for the others. And so um, so this is these are just the three individuals that we're working with and I, hopefully you know that the, the grant is to have um, in numbers in the 30s once we're done um, which given the the long-term treatment I think will we'll really be, a rich data set given the behavioral data we'll have in addition to the um, neural data. Um, so, so we have this question of sort of where are we gonna stimulate? So I, I kind of sold this whole thing as we're trying to get a very, we want a specific part of the brain to be active during our treatment so that that part of the brain gets more integrated into this network involved in performing that task. Um, so we have this question of sort of where are we gonna stimulate? Um, speech production we know requires a, a really complex network of regions. Um, there seems to be um, some agreement crystallizing around the importance of these ventral premotor and motor cortices involved in um, sort of the, the planning um, of, of production, um, of speech production, and which is the primary deficit associated with apraxia of speech. And, this this sort of um, centering on the those regions comes from um, studies looking at individuals with apraxia of speech as well as other studies looking at speech production in unimpaired individuals. And so our our thought, um, given given the importance of those regions, our our thought is we're going to try to stimulate that part of the brain during treatment um, and in order to get that part of the brain more active. So there's a number of issues, probably some of you have already thought of this, um, with this. So that tissue itself may not be there. It may be impaired. Um, also the lesion is going to drastically affect the current flow. Um, I have a slide to demonstrate that in a moment. Um, and so what we wind up doing is calculating the optimal electrode placement for each participant. And I'll, I'll give you a, a sense of how we're doing that, which I think is actually I've, I've come around to the idea that that's probably a really important part of um, doing this kind of work with individuals with stroke is, is really um, doing calculating the, the electrode placement individually. Um, so here's just a demonstration of why we maybe need to calculate it individually. Um, this comes from a study looking at um, simulations um, based upon a several different individuals with lesions. I'm just showing a few here. Um, and what you see, I, I thought I had this uh, animated a little bit more, but what, what you see here um, uh, in the, I don't, I don't know, if, is my mouse visible to people? Um, okay, what you see here is 
um, if you were, you know, they're trying to stimulate um, this part of the um, motor cortex that's um, commonly stimulated in um, studies involving um, arm movement and um, uh, with TDCS. And so th there's a very, <laughs> there, there's a sort of conventional placement of the electrodes um, in order to stimulate those regions. And what you see in this first column, this left column here, is the um, given the individual strokes that these individual given the strokes that these individuals had, what you see is if they were to put the electrodes in those conventional locations, where would the current go? And what you can see is that the current in many of these, in, in at least these few examples um, that, that are taken from a larger paper, would not go, would not be stimulating the region that we want to stimulate. Um, and instead, um, what we need to do is optimize our placement of the electrodes based upon the lesion itself. And so, um, so what we're what you're seeing in the second column is how much uh, current you could get to those regions were you to optimize um, the the electrode placement. And so, the general idea here, sorry, this, this circle is the area that we're really sort of focusing on here. And so, if we just use um, we just use the same um, electrode placement for each individual, then we might not be targeting the areas that we really want to target. Um, so um, our, our approach to this um, is, you know, to start by obtaining a really a, a good high resolution scan. Um, we're still in the one by one by one um, range at NYU. I don't know if you guys have access to a fancier scanner, maybe a pen. Um, uh, and then um, I have a a colleague, Lucas Para at CCNY, who um, who sort of automatically um, runs it through this uh, machine learning segmentation and um, and generates this version uh, generates a sort of a quick um, uh, segmented version of the scan that shows us you know bone and tissue, uh, gray matter, white matter, um, uh, fluid. Um, and we use this primarily um, to figure out, it, it's actually, it, it's not a very conservative metric, so it's more likely to throw out brain that may be actually there. Um, so because of that, um, we, we use that to figure out where we're going to try to stimulate. Um, so, so we have this, once we have this version that um, has been segmented into the different, um, different types of, um, information that's in that signal, we overlay the atlas that we use um, to find um, some tissue in our intact region of interest. And so um, our primary areas that we're trying to stimulate again are the sort of precentral gyrus, um, the ventral precentral gyrus, the atlas that we use, um, and I have, I have a bigger picture of this in a moment, but the atlas we use allows us to really um, the atlas we use has a lot of differentiation within these speech network speech regions, and so we can really sort of look at it. Has a region for the tongue and larynx, um, premotor and motor cortex. Um, the, the, that's one of the regions there, and so uh, as opposed to just looking at a sort of broader, um, many of the atlases people are um, there's just sort of one larger region in that um, premotor in a um, pre-central gyrus and the atlas we use has a little bit more differentiation. Again, it's, it's based upon um, connectivity data from unimpaired individuals. So then we, um, once we identify coordinates that we're trying to stimulate, then we perform the modeling to maximize the current to those regions of interest. Um, and then we obtain the right um, electrode placement. And um, as you could potentially guess, given those three very different scans I showed before, we have three very different electrode placements um, for these individuals that um, could not be predicted um, from just looking at, at the scan. Okay, um, so uh, I spent a lot of time on the setup. I'm gonna probably go through the, the speech outcome data relatively quickly, especially if we don't have a, a lot of individuals here. Um, and then sort of, um, we'll think about the, the neurobiological measures, talk about how we're looking at that now and other ways that we're thinking that we might be able to look at it um, in the future. So um, the primary speech outcome measures are um, production accuracy and changes during, um, you know, as a result of the treatment. 
Um, and then the primary neurobiological outcome measures are changes in the network connectivity within this uh, cortical speech network, um, which we obtain the activation from REST. So if you haven't seen these kind of single subject design data before, I'm just gonna sort of walk through one of these um, to give you a sense of what this kind of data looks like. And then, um, then I'll provide some summary data. Um, so the idea of this, again, I said we, we get a, a number of baseline sessions um, to make sure that people are reasonably stable and that you don't have this sort of rising baseline is the uh, least. Um, then we start the treatment and we probe the behavior during the treatment. And so um, we want to see, you know, is the behavior changing um, during the treatment? Um, and then we look at a maintenance period. And then uh, in this case, we have a short term and a long term maintenance period. And we're looking at, um, you know, the change from baseline in, in that. Um, because this is a crossover design, we have sort of two phases going on. So during the, during the um, treatment for phase one, um, nothing is happening with the targets for phase two. Um, and then um, during the treatment for phase two, nothing is happening to those targets from phase one. Um, and so, um, you know, the, the sessions that um, are on the same part on the, on the vertical um, axis are, are the same day. So the, the maintenance, the short-term maintenance for phase one takes place during part of the baseline for phase two, the second part of the baseline for phase two. Um, so, and effect sizes tend to be what's used and um, these effect sizes look giant if you're used to um, a classic 0 0.2, 0 0.5, 0 0.8, small, medium, large, Cohen's D. Um, the the uh, benchmarks that people use are different in different, um, are, are obviously very different for, um, for single subject design and are actually different within different domains. And so we've used benchmarks from a similar, um, similar types of studies to, to think about our performance. And so um, what, we're, what we're looking at here essentially is that, um, so the, the red is gonna be associated with the active phase and the blue or green, it's gonna be associated with the sham phase. And so for both of our phases of treatment, um, the short-term maintenance showed a, um, an effect. So these Cohen's Ds are falling to the small and medium range. Um, so there's some benefit for treatment. Um, that benefit, and that benefit is seen for both um, conditions and the benefit is actually larger at, um, at a follow-up for this first participant. Um, and more importantly, there's a bigger, um, the maintenance for the targets that are trained during active TDCS is um, greater than the maintenance for the targets trained during sham TDCS. So the idea is that, so um, the idea is that while these targets, so they, they're different targets, remember we have like uh, stop initial or fricative initial targets, that's kind of balanced across our individuals. Um, so um, those targets showed better um, maintenance, the, the targets trained during active phase showed better maintenance than the targets trained during the sham phase. Um, we had just have three individuals, so just to quickly go through them. Um, for our second individual, we, sh we saw um, similar um, short-term benefit for both groups. The, the numerical value is bigger um, for the active group, um, but, uh, but it, the, the effect size benchmark um, is still within that sort of small to medium range for both of them. For this individual, there was no long-term benefit. Um, this is obviously gonna be a really big part of the larger study is to figure out who is and is not a responder. Um, then for our third individual, who is the one who had the giant lesion um, that, that we saw before, we see huge um, treatment effects um, for the items that are trained during um, active TDCS. Um, so it's worth noting he started at pretty much a floor effect. He, he started um, very um, with very low performance at baseline, um, but showed a remarkable improvement. Um, during the short-term maintenance, which largely was maintained at um, the long-term maintenance. Um, for the targets that he was trained on with the sham TDCS, he showed a small um, treatment effect at 
uh, short term and that treatment effect went away. So, um, you know, these are just a few individuals, but first of all, we, we see a couple things that I, I think are gonna be patterns we're gonna pay a lot of attention to moving forward. One is that we have some responders and some non-responders. Um, and that's obviously something we, we really need to try to figure out. And I think that's something that, that a lot of the field is sort of grappling with right now is who responds and doesn't respond to the kind of treatments that we do. Um, so we see that, but right now we're seeing that the, the responders are showing a benefit for, um, for the maintenance, the long-term maintenance um, for what's being trained with active TDCS. Um, so, so this is our behavioral outcomes, uh, and um, you know, obviously, it'll it'll be nicer to look at many more individuals together. Um, it, part of the design of the single subject experimental designs, each person is their own experiment. So once you have a number of them, you've done all your counterbalancing. You really have several replications of an effect, hopefully. Um, so our are the sort of overall. Um, is that we, we see um, two really stronger um, responders who show um, medium to large effects at um, long-term maintenance. Um, and, um, and then everybody seems to show at least some effect at short-term maintenance, but that goes away, which I think comes back to this sort of just general idea. People will get better at what you're doing while you do it, um, but those effects don't always really maintain very well. Um, so this, the second part, um, that we're sort of interested in trying to figure out. So, you know, that is really like, the, that is a super important question. And I don't mean to go through it too fast. It's, it's you know, does this work? Can we enhance the treatment outcomes using um, TDCS? Um, do we get better maintenance? And, you know, I, I can't say anything now with just a few participants, but, it, you know, some of these things are pointing in a nice direction um, so far. The question I'm really more excited about here probably I, I think has the, the greater long term um, potential to extend across domains uh, and across areas is really, you know, did we do what we thought we would do did did stimulating this part of. Um, of the motor cortex during treatment did it actually mean that that part became a more integral. That, that it strengthened the sort of um, its role in that network. Um, that's really what we want to do. We want to have the goal was to see if we can make the left hemisphere um, part of that network um, play a bigger role. And so that's what we were trying to do. So we're examining this um, using REST. Um, and there's a number of reasons that, that we're doing that. And I'm happy to discuss those, why we're using REST rather than a task. Um, uh, you know, a lot of it is just the, the kind of movement artifacts that you get, um, both from patients and from speech production tasks, um, as well as um, kind of variability you get in performance within the scanner. It seemed like REST was a more, um, an easier way for us to really think about um, what was going on here. So um, for those who are unfamiliar with this idea, you know, during REST, the brain is active, things are the, you know, there, there's a lot going on in the brain even during rest. Um, and so what we, what people have been doing, you know, it's been a good um, decade or so um, that, that people look at the network structure. So which parts of the brain are sort of connected to other parts of the brain. Um, and so the idea is that you can take um, several different um, regions within the brain and look at their um, at their correlation over time. So as one goes up, what happens with the other one? And we can sort of figure out how strongly connected um, regions are within the brain. And, um, and that helps us to sort of understand um, the underlying network structure. And a, a lot of this work has involved sort of looking at um, these um, networks that you can pull out of a lot of different individuals. Um, uh, what we're doing is a little bit different. Um, we're, we're doing this sort of ROI-based network approach um, that, um, that really focuses on these speech regions in particular. Um, so there's sort of two ways um, that we're, we're doing this. Uh, one of them is a little more, um, one of them is more in progress. The other one is one that we've, we've sort of um, finished up. So one is to just select regions from the brain atlas that are associated with speech production. There's been several people who have 
done that. Um, and we, we sort of follow a previous study in doing that by using an expanded network, um, which we're sort of able to do using the particular atlas we're using. Um, a second way that we can do it, and we've started this, and um, I don't know that I'm going to have time to really get into it too much, um, but is to examine connectivity of the speech network and control participants. Um, and then sort of ask, so one question we can ask is, you know, how does the brain change um, as performance changes? And then we can ask, does it be, does it look more like control participants over time, or does it just mean that the left hemisphere is more active? And the, those two things may be a little bit different from one another. Um, and so I think ultimately we're gonna sort of wanna compare those two and figure out which one is um, more correlated with the behavioral changes. Um, so from the literature um, there, and it's particularly the literature on apraxia of speech. Um, so, uh, but, but also on speech production more generally, what I'm showing here is um, the uh, Fan et al. Brain et Tome Atlas. And this is the one that we're using. And so, um, so um, the, the sort of network that we've pulled out that we're looking at in, includes pars opercularis um, and some precentral gyrus regions. And so this is what I was saying before, there's this, I, I don't know if these letters are a little too small for you, but um, there is a region in the precentral gyrus, um, the tongue and the larynx is separated from the head and face regions here. And so looking at those sort of separately and then, um, within the post central gyrus looking at, um, again, a tongue and larynx region as well as um, a head and face region. And so really trying to sort of um, look at these networks. And of course, we're gonna look at them bilaterally. It, um, it seems like for the most part, the resting state networks are all bilateral. Um, and so this is sort of how I'm gonna present these data. Um, again, I'm just gonna sort of give you a sense of how we're going about it. Um, so, you know, we have several regions that we have identified, and this is just a correlation matrix where the warm colors mean that, um, that there's stronger correlations. Um, and so I have this set up so that um, this top uh, upper left quadrant is going to be the left hemisphere to left hemisphere connections. The um, this lower left quadrant and upper right quadrant is the interhemisphere connections and the um, and the lower right quadrant is the right hemisphere to right hemisphere connections. Um, so um, what we can do is look at individuals um, at the baseline session and then look after each phase of treatment and look at um, the, the network structure basically in, in those different time points. Um, one thing that you'll see here um, and I'm gonna point out and it's something we saw in all the individuals which is motivating our sort of second analysis here is that uh, it looks like at baseline, there is a um, very strong right hemisphere. These regions, these speechy regions in the right hemisphere are very interconnected. Whereas those same speechy regions in the left hemisphere are not very interconnected. And this is, you know, on some level, one of the questions that we have to grapple with is, you know, how much of that is due to stroke? How much of that can we, um, can we even overcome? Um, and I think that's going to really involve looking at um, some of the um, structural connectivity as well um, in the long run. So um, this is um, the data just from one of the individuals. Um, so you can see the um, at baseline compared to um, after a treatment phase, sorry, um, you can see that there's changes in these. Um, it's hard to really pull out what those changes are just um, visually. I'm going to show it to you in a slightly different way where I'm now showing the subtractions here. So, um, so these are the changes in activation after active, the active phase of treatment compared to baseline. And so what, you know, there's a lot of little squares here. They're all different colors. Um, what I think is sort of interesting um, is that these, these areas, this left hemisphere regions, and then these interhemispheric regions, we're seeing um, greater correlations in those regions after the active TDCS. And so what this means, again, this isn't during a task, this is just the connectivity of, um, within these regions, but it, it really does seem to be suggesting that those regions are better connected at, after that active 
um, stimulation session um, or phase, which was you know twelve sessions across four weeks, um, and and so you know this is sort of on some level what we were interested in trying to figure out is you know can we strengthen that network um, and you know just from this one picture it 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 looks like maybe we can um, we can also compare sort of at least. Um, you know the end versus baseline. Uh, this is one of those things. If we could, if we could scan people seven or eight times, we could really sort of um, titrate out. You know, a month later, four months later, it'd be, I, I'd be really excited to see those data. Right now, we're just sort of looking at, um, you know, comparing everything. If, if we compare sort of after even that second phase, which had sham stimulation to baseline, we do see that there's still a stronger left hemisphere network, which. Um, maybe bodes well for the um, maintenance idea um, that that using active TDCS. But again, um, this is something that we need to see over a larger number of individuals. So I'm just sort of showing um, these data here. Um, I know I'm running out of time a little bit. So I just wanted to sort of summarize this in a table, um, which is from our three individuals. And I, I do have the those um, heat maps um, in hidden slides, but um, we did see for both of our individuals that showed these, um, the, both of our responders, P1 and P3, we saw this increase in the left hemisphere connectivity, um, which I, you know, again, is, is exciting because it's consistent with this idea that maybe we can change how the brain is responding during treatment. Um, again, you know, the preliminary nature of these data are, you know, the, this, the, the low end at this point uh, means it's really just something to think about, but I think it's something to, to think about across domains, not only in the speech world, I think. Um, the other kind of findings that we're, we're seeing sort of changes after the sham phase, are, they're a little more complicated. I think um, it, nothing sort of jumps out in the same way. We also didn't have clear predictions there. So um, it'd be interesting to see, you know, how that right hemisphere changes. Um, again, that, that pattern that we saw here with this very, very strong right hemisphere network at baseline was something we've seen across everybody we've been looking at who um, in the, uh, are individuals with apraxia. And so um, that's something that, that we're really interested in looking at a little bit more. Um, just very quickly, um, one way that we're thinking about looking at this is comparing it to individuals, um, unimpaired individuals. And so one of the things we've been doing during the pandemic while we can't collect new data is to look at some data that's um, in some of these um, repositories um, that people can access. And so the OASIS-3 um, uh, database has individuals that are older. A lot of the open, open data um, has younger individuals that aren't necessarily gonna be the best controls for our participants. So the OASIS-3 has individuals that are older and we can sort of look at at the um, networks in we, we can look at these same networks in unimpaired individuals who are older so this gives you like many mental scores and um, and a variety of psych batteries so you can really select individuals who at the time of scanning have no um, no other impairments um, that we can then sort of look at their networks. Um, so I'm just gonna show you one way that we've been thinking about this um, for right now. So, um, so what I have on the top three here um, are what happens if we use just as a single seed region, that tongue and larynx um, part of the left hemisphere. We use that as a seed region and we look at um, the correlation with other regions in the brain. Um, this is again an unimpaired um, individual, but then we, we've actually, this is something that we've been able to do with 65, we were able to, to identify 65 individuals to, to look at in this data set. Um, but it, just for this one individual, just to give you a sense of what this actually looks like, um, if we take that, that region, that we're, which is the one that we're trying to stimulate um, when there's enough tissue for somebody, um, to stimulate that. If we take that region as a seed and look at what it's connected to throughout the brain, um, and this is this top row is using the, the left hemisphere region as a seed, and the bottom row is using the right hemisphere region as a seed. So what we see in, um, in an unimpaired 
individual here is that you really do have a strong bilateral network connected to that um, connected to that region, that tongue and larynx region. Um, you have a strong bilateral network that um, is, you know, includes includes regions that you might predict would be associated with this. So it includes some speech regions as well as some maybe language ear region, regions as well. Um, and so I just wanted to show you what it looks like when we um, when we look at this in one of our individuals. So this again, the red one means basically that that's, <laughs> that's the correlation of one because that's the region we're using as the seed. And so what you can see really at this, this is uh, that first time point for the individual whose data we looked at before. So now this is just taking that one tongue and larynx region and looking at that. And what we can see is if we look at the left hemisphere um, as the seed, there's very little connectivity in other parts of the brain um, and even within the left hemisphere. Whereas if we take the right hemisphere as the seed, they look a lot more like the control participant, although they don't really look exactly like the control participant, um, but a lot more like that. Um, so we're going to do this in, in some more sophisticated ways, but this is the way we've been, um, we're, we're starting to just sort of talk about it and think about it. So, um, so that, so now I'm sort of just showing that same participant after the active phase. Um, so basically now we're still using that same tongue and larynx region as the seed and we're looking at um, where, the, where the connections are and what we see, <laughs> it's not some huge, huge effect necessarily, but we, we do see that there's greater connectivity within these very speechy regions in the left hemisphere, which I think, um, I mean, it really is the same exact data as the other slide, so, um, so it, it makes sense that they're similar, but um, I just wanted to sort of show you a, a different way to like visualize and think about these data. Um, so I, I think sort of more generally, you know, we're hoping that this is just a very small example of directing the neurobiological response to treatment. Um, I think our early data are interesting and promising, but they're obviously it's limited in a, in a variety of ways. Um, so, and I think, you know, the responders that we have so far are showing these enhanced left hemisphere networks. Um, and um, clearly, I think this will really benefit from more structural connectivity analyses and um, looking at this in a couple of different ways as well. But I, I think that this general idea, this general question, doing it in this sort of, uh, you know, thinking about testing one of these very small but clear mechanistic hypotheses of you know, exactly how TBCS might um, enhance recovery um, could really have implications across um, different parts of the rehab sciences that, um, that people are working on. Um, and you know, I, there's nothing really very original here. We're really riding on the coattails of other people. We're really trying to take a, a very controlled domain to ask these kinds of um, questions a little more um, precisely than have been done in this area in the past. Um, so I have uh, a million people to acknowledge for um, this work and just thank you for your um, time and attention to, to me for today. Thank you very much, Adam. We do have a little bit of time for questions. Great. Laurel, you got there first. Oh. <laughs> That took one time in my life I got first for anything. <laughs> um, thank you, Adam. I thought that was great and really promising and interesting work. Um, and I really liked the way you tied together the connectivity, the TDCS and the behavior. Um, so uh, am I understanding that the, the training paradigm that you used was a, was a repetition paradigm? Is that right? It is. But I mean, it's sort of structured the way a lot of these um, motor learning in um, the speech motor learning studies are structured in adults where you, the, the actual task is repetition, but, um, but you're beginning with, um, you, you are providing a little bit of feedback along the way. And you're also beginning each session with what people call a pre-practice where you're really working on, on hitting the targets sort of exactly. But then during the practice itself, it's largely a repetition task with a little feedback. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, and that makes a lot of sense in the context of, you know, you really want to isolate that um, apraxia of speech per se and not get into all the other stuff that goes along with right. 
semantic retrieval and phonological right. access and all that other stuff. But I'm just, so I, I just want, wonder if you could speculate though about whether you think or whether you have any data that would speak to whether um, the improvement that you see on these repetition tasks, you know, how well should that hold up in naming or in something where people have to go, you know, go through the, the two-step right. <laughs> interactive, you know, what do you yeah. think? Yeah, I mean that, you know, that is a question I'm, you know, deeply interested in <laughs> is the the sort of interaction between sort of these languagier things yeah. and speechier things. Um it is it is the case for this that, you know, to test this smaller hypothesis, we're really interested in trying to isolate, uh, as you said, um, that. And, and we have a number of different ways that we're sort of thinking about that you know, the testing that we're actually learning something that's not individual words, for example. So um, so within each of these, so if we're treating, um, you know, something that's stop initial, we also save some other stop initial sequences that we can look at for generalization. Um, the real answer is that w there's that paper from a few years ago by um, the other Sarah Edwards. Uh, the other Sarah Wallace, sorry, um, the one in Australia of um, all the uh, all, all this battery that we should be using in all of our um, aphasia, um, you know, treatment studies, and we are using that battery. We we do some. We get um, we we do get a lot of behavioral data at each of those um, follow up sessions as well, and so. I think the answer is we just have to see. I, I don't have a good story about why exactly it would or wouldn't right now, sort of um, uh, why, why there would or wouldn't be some sort of carryover to higher level things, but we're sort of structuring it in a way to focus on the speech. Um, and so then, you know, that obviously that there's been a lot of debates over the years about, you know, the, the bi-directionality of that. Um, you know, whether working on something speech at the speech level will actually um, have some sort of feedback effects and enhance something at the language level. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I can say that we're, we have built in the capacity to answer that question, but I don't have a good answer for it as of this point. Mm -hmm. Thank you. John? Uh, you're muted. You're I, I also yeah. uh, also really enjoyed uh, the talk and the, especially the sort of cross-cutting uh, principles that you were exploring. Um, I wanted to ask you um, specifically about the severity dimension. Um, I, I, I'm not very familiar with the uh, single subject method of calculating effect size, but I was sort of struck by the fact that person who got such a big effect size had practically no function in the beginning. And that made me wonder about sort of the scaling of the behavioral change. And I suppose one could wonder a similar thing about the scaling of the connectivity change. If people go from having no connectivity to a little connectivity, how does that show up in the metric as compared to pretty good con connectivity to even better. So if you could just say something about uh, both on the behavioral and on the uh, Im imaging side, how you think of coping with that severity spectrum. Right, um, well, I've definitely thought about the behavioral side of that quite a bit more. Um, you know, th that is a limitation of this kind of work is that the standard deviation during um, during those baseline sessions is going to necessarily affect that computation, um, which is sort of always the case in effect size calculations, right. but it's particularly an issue there. I think, you know, the one, I, I guess the one way that uh, that I, the one thing that makes me not worry about that too much, I mean, I, I worry about everything, right? But the one <laughs> thing that makes me not worry about that too much is, um, is that it, it's very similar in the two different types of sequences that we're, training for the for people and and we are intentionally trying to line up that um baseline performance um so that you know we might have some people who are just way better at one type of sequence than another but but so far we haven't and and part of what you know we have like one or two pretest sessions in which we really try to figure out exactly what we're doing and so one thing we've done is scale back very strongly for that person the one who was really 
poor and then show the big effects. We mm. scaled back a lot on what we were actually training. So for the for the individuals that are sort of like mild to moderate, we're trying to train um, speech sequences. So consonant clusters like, like PL and please. Um, and for that individual, we're just really working on single sounds and the onset of a word. And he's, he's really producing um, CVC or CV a lot um, words that just don't, you know, in order to try to address that. Um, I think, you know, part of, uh, and I guess part of the, the, the bigger answer is that part of what you get in this single subject design is that each person is their own control. And so you're not exactly comparing um, from one person's effect to the, you know, you're not saying that person improved 20% and this person improved 30%. You're, everything is relative to their own performance. Well, yeah, except when you go on to talk about who's a responder or what predicts responders. If it, if it could turn out to be trivial, uh, who's a responder is the person who has a lower standard deviation before the response. But I mean, I'm, I'm not right. necessarily no, seriously no, right. proposing that, but, but, <laughs> but that's, it's a, that's, it's, you know, I, I, I suppose it's one of those things that, um, like, like a lot of things, like as, as we go, as we move on and we see sort of what those baseline patterns really look like, we will have to think about that in, in a couple of different ways. I really have not thought about what it means at the neural level. I have to be honest, what it means to have sort of no network versus some network yeah. compared to some network versus more network. I mean, I'll, you know, a lot of the way you actually do these comparisons involves like sort of C-scoring to try to address certain um, types of changes like that. And um, But I'm not, I, I really need to think about that more. It's a really good question. I need to Thanks. talk to my collaborators about that. So thank you. Thank you. Dylan? Thanks, Adam. I, I really like that talk as well. Um, quick question about the brain stimulation side. Uh, I really like the idea of you taking care with, you know, with Lucas to look at the current flow and how vastly different it was actually that you found that people are completely stimulating in a wrong, the wrong area if they don't consider that. Um, I'm wondering with, and I, I like you targeting one place, uh, but you've also shown us that there's the contra lesional side and uh, intra, intra hemispheric networks as well. I'm just thinking if we, if you can, I, encourage you to continue that level of rigor, first of all, testing this single place. And I'm just wondering if you might speculate, you know, with just given with the climate at the moment with clinical trials, they're launching into these bilateral stimulation, TDCS protocols or multifocal. Um, so if you were to, what do you think about, you know, speculating as to where you might either target next or, or multinodal targeting? Uh, Mike Fox from Boston showed that you could target multiple nodes of the network simultaneously and have a stronger, you know, where would you target next? Would you do this sort of transcolossal or would you would target somewhere else within the same hemisphere? Just speculation. Right. I, I guess right now, given given the story that we've been, um, that, that I've been pitching here, I, I guess I would, you know, be working. So right now we're using a two by two montage with those individuals and depending upon the amount of tissue there, we are potentially sort of, um, one is in the tongue larynx region and one is in the head face region, if, if there's more of that tissue gone. So I think we would probably stick in the left hemisphere. I think that what people sometimes call the bilateral stimulation really means the, the anode on one side and the cathode, you know, whether, however many electrodes you have, the anode on one side and the cathode on the sort of, um, the the, uh, the homologous region and the other hemisphere, that feels like not the right way to strengthen the network to me, um, because we, we, we probably do want that interhemispheric connectivity as well. Um, so I, I think that as I've, you know, as I've thought about it, we would probably think about integrating it with, with other areas and, and sort of this newer way that we've been looking at it by using the OASIS database and thinking about what that, what are the other areas that are really part of that network in unimpaired individuals? You know, um, maybe that will give us some ideas of different different directions to look. Um, I guess. That's good. Yeah. Thanks, Adam. That's great. 
Oh, sorry, I know I went we've long. We've already. So. Yeah, I was about to say that we've already kept you over, but but thank you so much for a very very interesting talk. Thank you guys <clears throat> so much for having me. Great to see you, Adam. Thank you. Yeah.